Hi, I just wanted to uh, check if my audio is working and if you can hear me clearly. Um, all right. Um, well, welcome. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you to the Karwan Initiative for having invited me and um, uh, getting me to talk about the politics of interior design. Um, before we really get down to the talk, uh, the first thing to really think about is that every house, no matter which house we live in, um, goes through lots and lots of changes as time goes on. Um, a house is designed because of exigencies and requirements that you might have at one time, but those requirements keep changing as time goes along. And what I'm going to do is try and take us through um, the changes that have happened in Rashtrapati Bhavan. Um, for instance, what you can see on your screen right now is one of the nurseries that used to once be there in Rashtrapati Bhavan, a children's nursery that was designed by Edwin Lutyens. And a children's nursery requires furniture to be low. It requires uh, small chairs, low sofas, uh, wide chairs in which the nannies and ayahs could play with the children, uh, tables at which the children could work, and um, it had lamps in it which were designed specially by Latians to be witty, to be more appropriate for a children's room and a children's environment. Um, this is, uh, this room doesn't exist in Rashtrapati Bhavan anymore. Um, well, because uh, houses change. Presidents are now so much older that um, they don't have toddlers who need um, um, you know, they don't have toddlers who need nurseries. So um, we, we, we can see over here, for instance, um, how the, the house which was originally designed um, has changed. I mean, in this photograph, you can see, for instance, the curtains which were very appropriate for a children's nursery, or you can see lamps with horses galloping. Um, in, a, in another picture, you can see a fisherman, um, and the fishing rod has a bulb at the end of it instead of the hook which the fish are going to catch. Um, there, was, there were different requirements that the house had. But what's also very interesting is that these kinds of things also had documentation that went along with it. Latians prepared detailed sketches of the interior designed for each room that make it clear as to which items were originally intended for which room. And sometimes these sketches also give us indications about the color palette or the upholstery, the light fittings, the wall clocks that were designed for each room. Um, this attention to detail is one of the great features of, of uh, the work of Edwin Latians. And um, these detailed sketches today can be used by us for, all, for us to be able to restore the house, to be able to reconstruct the house, um, to be able to understand how that house really, if we, the sketches are so detailed, they're sometimes made on a one-to-one -one ratio even. Um, so we know how the joinery in the furniture worked. And if anything gets broken down today, we can go back to that documentation and try and restore it and fix it in the way that that furniture was intended to be or designed that, redesigned that room in the way that it was designed, it was originally meant to be. Um, these um, sketches were collected um, at a time when I was invited along with Professor Partha Mitha to do a book on, um, on the arts and interiors of Rashtrapati Bhavan. The book was subtitled Latians and Beyond. And I'm going to try today and give a short synopsis of some of the main issues that that book deals with. But I'm also going to take you through the extraordinary documentation and research that we were able to gather uh, for the purpose of writing that book. The book really would not have been possible had it not been for the masterly photographs of Joginder Singh. He, um, 
really followed the intention that we as uh, we as scholars had that came together, a team of scholars came together to be able to bring out some of these design features of this house and what the interior would have looked like. And he photographed it from that perspective to be able to bring out the architectural design, but also the design of the interior. Now, when studying interiors and when studying architecture, there's a certain politics that goes behind it. And so what I'm going to do in my talk today is focus on the politics behind the interior design. How did that house change? And why did it change from what it was originally designed as, as Viceroy's house, into Rashtrapati Bhavan? Um, you know, as a visual art historian, I know, you know, you, we all know that old adage that a picture says a thousand words. But how can it be made to say a thousand words through a lens of design? And that's what I'm going to try and focus on in, in my talk with you today. Every home we know is an expression of its occupant. Now we should go further and also acknowledge that every home is also an expression not just of who its occupant is, but also what that occupant wants to project or wants to be seen as. What have been the nature of the changing political imperatives of its occupants that Rashtrapati Bhavan had to express? Now, there's a third layer of expression, however, which can be read into this, also by looking at the intentions of the designer, or in this case, the architect. Need occupants comply with or live by the vision of the architect, or are they at liberty to alter it um, because they feel, the people who are living in the house, feel differently? So, um, it's, it's, that's what we are going to, um, uh, that's what we're going to try and focus on. Now, Latian's solutions to this matter were politically fraught problems, which he had to think through and create a harmonious and judicious amalgamation of many different design principles. And that reveals a far-sighted astuteness on the part of the designer. Um, it also reveals his command on many different elements of design, Chinese, Gothic, um, Palladian, uh, Indian, uh, uh, many different Indian designs, whether it was Mughal or coming from temple art and architecture. Um, so what I'm going to try and do today is to see what were the pressures on this designer and how did he try and create a harmonious building that did not betray or, uh, or did try to do justice to the many different influences that were there around him at the height of the colonial empire. And he created this interior um, because, um, because of an extraordinary amount of documentation that had been done by the time he came to design this house so he could learn about many different traditions of architecture. When we're talking about design, we also have to think about not just how a building physically looks, but also how it feels. How is a designer able to control the mood of the people who occupy that house? Now, this is a very diff difficult thing to talk about empirically because this is something very subliminal and subconscious. How do you feel when you're in a space? How does the light change your mood? Uh, what do you see out of the window? How do you sense the garden while you're sitting indoors can change? What is the season outside doing to how you are feeling inside? And these things is, are something that I'm going to try and focus on in, in this talk to see, firstly, what was the extraordinary achievement of this designer and how fantastically this, design, this building is designed. Um, but I'm also going to try and focus on how there's a very deeply personal quality in the detailing of this house. Every little knob or a latch, a hinge of a window or a door, the lamp that is inside a room or a clock. Um, what I'm going to try and do is focus on these little design elements of the interior to try and see how these 300 odd rooms of this 
um, uh, uh, how the 300 odd rooms of this house can actually feel. And this brings out their tactility, their everyday use, um, which makes it a really important case study for anyone who wants to study design history. Now, for those of you who know Rashtrapati Bhavan, um, you know that it is, this is a picture, for instance, that was taken um, shortly after the house had been completed in 1931. And we all know the famous controversy that it was not intended to look like this because um, originally when he had planned it, north and south block were supposed to be right next to the house. Um, there were many negotiations that Latians and his patrons had to navigate before the house ended up looking like the way it does now. So a little needs to be explained about the context behind the creation of this grand palace. Why was such a big palace made, and why was it made in the manner that it was? What had been made before this palace was made, so that it could incorporate all those different design elements, and which design elements did it choose to discard? Several articles had appeared in the Indian and British press immediately after the announcement by George V and the 1911 Delhi Darbar that a new Delhi was going to be built as the capital city. These articles speculated about what the chosen art architectural style of the city would be. Was the new city going to be British or was it going to be Greco-Roman? Were they going to choose a Mughal style or was it going to have another look? Now, we need to remember that government art schools were also created around the subcontinent by the mid 19th century. The first of these had emerged out of a private in initiative in 1850 by Alexander Hunter in Madras, before it was taken over by the government two years later in, 19, in 1852, and renamed the Government College of the Government School of Industrial Art. Two years after that, another school was set up in Calcutta, and in 1866, the management of the JJ School of Art was taken over by the government. Lockwood Kipling was a professor in this school, and he established ateliers for decorative painting and ornamental ironwork. Now, alongside, there were massive projects of documentation that were being undertaken by scholars and photographers, archaeologists and artists, and these were supplemented and informed by major exhibitions of Indian art, craft and industry, which were happening in Britain and France. Most significantly, for instance, was the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations that was held at the Crystal Palace in London, which was a landmark affair in 1851. These um, documentation projects of traditional Indian architectural design and ornament had been, as I was saying, initiated by the mid 19th century. They were put together in these lavish series of portfolios prepared under the direction of Thomas Hendley, an officer with the Indian Medical Service. He was the residency surgeon of Jaipur, and he developed an interest in Indian art and helped set up the Jaipur Museum, which is today called the Albert Hall Museum. Documentation projects also included photographic ones, the most comprehensive of which were undertaken by Linnaeus Stripe or Samuel Bourne, Raja Deen Dayal, Captain Impey, these exhaustive official documentations uh, included that of the Archaeological Survey of India. So one of the best ones was a 12-volume tome that was prepared by Colonel, Swin uh, um, Colonel Samuel Swinton Jacob, who was later knighted, and Sir Samuel Swinton Jacob, as he was later known, and Sir Thomas Hendley. This was followed by many other portfolios, like the one on Indian architectural drawings prepared by Edmund Smith, and another one called the Technical Art Series of Illustrations of Indian Architectural Decorative Work for the Use of Art Schools and Craftsmen. Finally, we got Birdwoods, the Industrial Arts of India, which had been published in 1888. Now, all of this documentation of what Indian art looked like was already available to a designer like Edwin Latians. And this was coupled along with the demands at that time of what was called the arts and crafts movement. The arts and crafts movement's espousers 
were pitted against the politics and economics of colonialism. And they tried to resist the replacement in the market of Indian handmade products by the British mill made products. The arts and crafts movement, Stenet, took on a more radical political dimension in India and received a major boost in the early years of the 20th century from Rabindranath and Abhinindranath Tagore by E.B. Havel and by Ananda Kumaraswamy. Most importantly, Gandhi, in fact, translated unto this last um, a text by John Ruskin, which he derived a lot of inspiration from when he wrote Hind Swaraj. Um, following his important book in 1909 called The Indian Craftsman, Ananda Kumaraswamy, the famous Indian art historian, even addressed the annual industrial conference in Allahabad. And he, in fact, went on to say that if we are to judge from the wreckage of India's industrial arts, which are remaining to us, wreckage as in the wreckage that has been undertaken by the British Empire by industrialization, we must rank the civilization of India very highly indeed. For it could have been truly said that in her homes, whether rich or poor, there could be found nothing that was either not useful or beautiful. Now, in exchange for this world of beauty that was our birthright, the 19th century has made us a dumping ground for all the vulgar superfluities of European overproduction. And all that the Swadeshi movement of the 20th century has done is to provide us with many spurious imitations of these unlovely inutilities. Never have I seen in any Swadeshi literature the wish expressed to preserve Indian manufactures on account of their intrinsic excellence or because of the presence amongst us of these highly skilled craftsmen who still work under the conditions of life still infinitely superior, physically and spiritually, to those of the European factory slaves. I know no more sign more ominous for the future of Indian civilization than our utter indifference to social industrial idealism and the heartless callousness with which we have cast aside the services of those who built our homes and clothed and wrought for us in the days before we learnt to despise our own culture, leaving them to eke out a precarious living by making petty trivialities for tourists, curio collectors, and for Anglo-Indian bungalows, or to drift into the ranks of menial laborers or factory hands. You see, the nationalist Indian demand for an Indian aesthetic was thus part of a much wider demand to give jobs to Indian mysteries and architects to keep the great traditions of Indian architecture and masonry and furniture alive and not to reduce them into becoming laborers. Thus, the intellectual climate in 1909, 1911, when the creation of New Delhi was announced, was one in which there were many who wanted to have buildings and their interiors to showcase the finest Indian craft and skill, as much to preserve and protect them as to politically showcase an Indian identity. So Latians was faced with this challenge where he had to incorporate many aspects of Indian art and Indian sensibility along with the requirement to make a building that would showcase the might of the British Empire. So these kinds of preparatory sketches which are now preserved in the Royal Institute of British Architects archive which is now housed in the V&A Museum in London were really important because they reveal something of the thinking of this architect designer. On one sketchbook page, you can see on the right that he is experiencing, he's experimenting with Gothic arches and trying to create a dome more in the Gothic style than in the Islamic. But on the other hand, you see a building which he has created with a cupola which has overhanging eaves or a chajja, very much in the Indian style. And right on top of it all, he has a finial, which has symbols of different Indian religions put right on top. So he's trying to incorporate these different design elements. These are some of those experimental sketches that he made, um, experience, trying to see what are the different kinds of column designs that he could use, what are the different kinds of domes. Would it be a flat dome? Would it be a tall dome like St. Paul's? Is it going to be a huge? Is it going to be like a Buddhist stupa, which is what he eventually settled on? Um, these sketches, therefore, are extremely revealing. Like in this one, you can see that he's trying out different arches. 
different doorways, a square doorway with a lintel, a Mughal arch on the one hand, a Gothic or a Roman arch in the third side. He hasn't yet decided what the look of the building is going to be. Here you can see him trying to experiment with different designs of domes. He's even trying out an, an onion dome, more like a kind of a Turkish-inspired dome type. Now coming back to this sketch, this is a colored version of the sketch that he obviously thought a lot about because there are multiple versions of the finial uh, where he's trying to uh, think about, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Now, as I was saying, when we study design, one thing that you have to remember is, what's the building made for? Every designer or architect needs to think about the utility. What's the building for? Who's going to live in it? Who's going to work in it? And how does the worker feel while working there? So it's quite informative to go back to these old floor plans. Oh dear, sorry, there's a call I'm getting. Seeing my sidebar, it never changed. So what can you see now? So, um, I can try this. Right. Can you see Imperial Delhi Day Nursery? All right, okay, so I'll try and uh, pick up from where we left off. Um, how, as I was saying, houses go through lots of changes and we don't have nurseries or billiards rooms and things like that in Rashtrapati Bhavan anymore because there are no children in Rashtrapati Bhavan and there aren't, um, no, no presidents are busy playing billiards any longer. It's just not the done thing. Um, similarly, the ballroom isn't used as a ballroom anymore. Um, there are many reasons why houses go through changes. But what I'm not, and what I'm going to try and focus on instead is to try and go into not the normal course of changes that have happened in a house, but into the politics of interior design. How was this house transformed from being Viceroy's house once upon a time into Rashtrapati Bhavan subsequently. And my lecture is based on a book that I was invited to edit along with Professor Partha Mitter. And the uh, book was created with the able work of the photographer Joginder Singh, who took all the marvelous pictures that I'm going to show you, the modern pictures, which have been supplemented by a lot of archival work that we were able to do in Britain and in India at different archives to be able to look into this building. So. As I was saying earlier, before we had that technical glitch, every home is an expression of the person who lives in it, its occupant. But we should go further and also acknowledge that every home is also an expression, not just of who the occupant is, of that occupant, but also what that occupant wants to project or how that occupant wants to be seen. What have been the changing political imperatives of the occupants of Rashtrapati Bhavan, which this building's interior has had to express? Now, all of this has to be conditioned against a third variable, which is a layer of expression that can be read into this building by looking at the intentions of the designer or the architect Edwin Latians. A resulting question is that do occupants simply have to comply with or live by the vision of the architect or do they have their own agency in how they want to live in that house? We can answer that once we really assess what it is that Latians tried to create. A fantastic amalgamation of many different styles so that his building would have a lasting legacy that would please many different types of people who would come to live in it in the years that would go on, in the centuries forward. So he incorporated Chinese and Gothic, Islamic, Indian, Hindu, uh, a variety of Indian ideas, 
Greco-Roman, Palladian um, ideas all into this building so that they could all be, they could be something that different types of occupants would find agreeable. And this was a politically astute decision, but it is not something that is quite that easy to execute. You have to be a far-sighted architect who has to imbibe all these different design styles and orders of architecture to create something that hangs together, not like a patchwork, which is a little bit of a Mughal style and a little bit of a Hindu temple style, a little bit of a Buddhist stupa that doesn't hang together. But in Rashtrapati Bhavan, we see something extraordinary where these things have been brought together into a harmonious whole. And that is his greatest achievement. And this achievement was created despite great opposition. Or shall I say, because of the great opposition. I don't think Latins would quite have managed to create such an impressive building that amalgamated these different traditions if he hadn't been challenged as much as he was. So the building, as we famously know, went through many changes. The North Block and South Block were once supposed to be, as per the original sketch, right next to the building. But Latians came back to Delhi and once and found that Rashtrapati Bhavan had been pushed back while it was only North Block and South Block that you could see from the bottom of Raisina Hill. These were changes that were happening at a time because of personal conflicts, they were happening because of misunderstandings, but there were also, there was another layer of pressure on the architect. And that was because there was, a, by, by the time Latins was given the contract in 1911 to design a new Delhi, after the famous Delhi Darbar of George V, uh, when an announcement was made that a new city of Delhi had to be created, Latians found that there was already a huge bibliography that existed, a massive amount of scholarship on a documentation of Indian art. Many books had been prepared that had not just photographed, but sketched portfolios of what Indian design was all about. And there was an expectation that this would be followed. Indian nationalist leaders were pushing for a more Indian design and the Swadeshi movement was catching, was, was gaining ground. The Swadeshi movement till the time when people like Ananda Kumaraswamy stepped in was simply trying to reproduce things in India that were going to be made in the European style but made in India. Kumaraswamy instead shifted the focus and said, we need to start looking at what Indians made and why for their own needs, not just in imitation, not just that Indian craftsmen can imitate what Europeans can do. That's not a good definition of Swadeshi. He wanted a different def definition of Swadeshi to be brought in. He also wanted to bring back employment for Indian mysteries, Indian craftspeople, to be able to get those get them to have an honorable existence as innovators rather than just become laborers. Um, the arts and crafts movement to which Kumaraswamy belonged took on a very political dimension, therefore. Gandhi was very much a follower of the arts and crafts movement, heavily inspired by it. And it can be argued that Hind Swaraj, his manifesto, is in many ways derived from John Ruskin's Unto This Last. Uh, Ruskin's was a follower of the arts and crafts, one of the great espousers of the arts and crafts movement. Similarly, Rabindranath Tagore had set up Shanti Niketan. Abhinindranath Tagore and E.B. Havel had tried to change the curriculum for Indian art schools to start making things that were more located within the Indian ethos and Indian aesthetic. And these ideas had begun to exert a political pressure on designers like Latians. So when we look at Latin's sketches, which are lying in archives, mostly in Britain, we're able to see how he was sketching different things. On the right, you can see he's trying to experiment with Gothic architecture, but on the left, it's very much an Indian building like a chhatri with a chhajja. And right on top of it, there is a finial, which incorporates the symbols of different Indian religions. So there's a pressure on this architect to be able to please different Indian customs and amalgamate them with design 
sensibilities that come from different orders of world architecture. These are some of the sketches in which we can see his experimentation. Different kind of doorways, a Gothic doorway on the left, a Roman archway above it, a Mughal arch on the, in the center top, a square lintel, a, a square door below that. He hadn't yet decided how he wanted the facade of Rashtrapati Bhavan to look. You can see here he's experimenting with different kinds of domes, an inner dome, an outer dome, like you have at Humayun's tomb or the Taj Mahal. Um, he is looking also at onion domes, which were more popular in the Turkish and Central Asian world. This is a more detailed colored sketch of the finial on top of the dome, where he's experimenting with different kinds of, of symbols. But before I get into all of this amalgamation, every house, we need to remember, is designed for certain occupants. And looking at the ground plans of Rashtrapati Bhavan is very informative. There's a lower basement which is meant to be occupied by the people who work in the house, the servants who are going to be serving, who are going to need their own kitchens and larders and carpentry rooms and workshops in which to work. They need to access the upper floors. They need rooms in which they're going to change, rooms in which they're going to live. Certain staff are going to need kitchens and dining rooms in which they can eat. Um, they also need, there are going to be other staff that visit during the day who have, to be who have to be resident in the compound, but not necessarily living within the premise in the house itself. What staircases and passageways are these people going to use when they are in the house? And how are they going to be different from the ones that are going to be used by state guests? How does your mood, how is your mood controlled by the windows and the vistas that you will see, by the kind of staircases that you're going to go running up and down? These were the kind of details that the architect had to pay a lot of attention to because it was a ceremonial house. And that's why looking at these sketches becomes very useful for us because we can actually compare how the window sizes are changing, the staircases are changing, what is the frequency with which you encounter a window, what principles of foreshortening are being used, how is grandeur being enhanced by the time you come into the upper floors, which are meant for the great state guests and then there are the residential rooms for the, for the state guests, for these very state guests. And what kind of interior are they going to be put in so that they come away with a certain feeling, a certain mood when they, when they uh, come to live in Rashtrapati Bhavan. So these were the kinds of things that we were interested in examining in trying to see how the building was lived in when it was, um, when it was designed. Um, the pressure on Latians, as I was saying earlier, was to be able to amalgamate the different traditions of India. And some of these ideas were almost superficial, like the finial design that he came up with at one stage, which was never executed. There was so much pressure on him that he once made a famous quip. He said, they want me to do Hindu. Hin don't, I say. You know, this was one of the most, he was a very um, witty architect. and. Uh, this pressure on him to, to amalgamate a lot of Hindu elements in the design was there right from the start. In fact, in response to it, he came up with something called the Delhi Order of Columns, where he gave four temple bells at the edges of the column, and um, we can see preparatory sketches for them. And so all over the main ceremonial spaces of Rashtrapati Bhavan, you will see that he's created a new design of a, of a column in which he's incorporated the bells on top. Rooms were, you know, even when it came down to the soft furnishings in the house, um, he was quite inspired by Indian fabric, Indian textiles, justifiably so, because after all, um, you know, the, the building, India was so famous for its textile traditions, and he felt that 
using Indian textiles as much as possible would be appropriate for the design of this house. What you see over here is that he settled for an interior which uses chintz in its upholstery. But he actually wanted a monochrome khadi. What had happened by that stage, however, was the Indian national movement had gained so much ground and Khadi was so closely linked with Gandhi's ideology that he was not allowed to use Khadi for the furnishing fabrics of, of the house. It was regarded as too political a statement. And so he had to settle for a more, um, a, a different design palette. And he chose instead to use um, chintz in a lot of the loose covers for the furniture. He incorporated Mughal Jalis in, um, um, in the building. And the, the building, as you can see, the Jalis which you have over here are of different designs. So the central one has, looks as if it's been derived directly from the tradition of Mughal Jalis as seen in the Red Fort in Delhi. But the other ones incorporate more radical Art Nouveau patterns which are being mixed with uh, the design palette of the Mughals. So he's trying to mix up, create an amalgamation, a hybrid design of European sensibilities, Art Nouveau, the arts and crafts movement, along with Mughal, along with Hindu elements, which are all coming together in the building of this house. He was very keen on amalgamating also our understanding of the climate. What do you see out of the windows and the doors uh, as you go through the house? Light was extremely important. So again and again, as you go through the house, you come across verandas, courtyards, large windows, which create vistas and bring the climate and bring the outside inside. The cleanliness of line and order and some of the design elements were quite radical, like this nautilus fountain, just using the spiral, the Fibonacci, and the idea of the eternal movement progression, which you get in an ammonite shell, using the principles of mathematics very clearly in this fountain. But in other places, he used a different design element. For instance, um, he used um, these fountains, which were derived out of uh, um, an element that he had seen encountered in Nepal, where you had these uh, snake capitals, crowning elements on columns, which he used as a fountain in another courtyard. So where he's using the spiral in one, he's using a chevron and a vertical in the other. So there's a kind of a pairing in the way that he is creating these spaces. The attention to detail, I mean, look at the bronze casting, look at the movement of the spiral of the snake itself. Of course, all these spaces have changed over time. But what I'm interested in is giving you a flavor first of all the different design elements that exist within this building. So here, for instance, this famous set of fountains around the gardens. It's a planned garden that you can see of Rashtrapati Bhavan at the, at the rear of Rashtrapati Bhavan. And he's derived the pattern from a lotus, but he's executed it in a completely Art Nouveau modern style. So he's, he is a modernist for sure, but he is somebody who has thorough training in the design repertoire of traditional systems and orders of architecture of different systems in the world. This courtyard, for instance, is designed like a charbagh with a central fountain. The elements are almost like pendants in pieces of Mughal jewelry in the floor. But the arch at the back is clearly derived from the design of a Roman arch. The open courtyard is framing the sky. And that's what he does. He frames the sky and brings it into different portions of the house. Now, this courtyard is not on ground floor level. It's on one of the upper floors. Of the, of the building, next to, in fact, what is the cabinet room. Water, as we've been seeing, plays an integral part in his design sensibility. Now, this is a shot of what is called the gray dining room. 
and there are these Roman fountains that there's a pair of Roman fountains on either side uh, flanking the room. And um, the, the fountains create a soundscape of water while people are dining. This is extremely important because um, what we are getting in different spaces in this house is that he's, he's quite clear about the mood he wants people to have. Here, this is clearly the Roman element, as I was saying, the imperial lion that is being used as a water spout in the gray dining room. The courtyard that was linked to the, China, to the children's uh, nurseries was designed like a Chinese courtyard with this lattice work. The children could therefore have an experience of the outdoors, but the wall of the courtyard was so high that they couldn't fall down. So the safety of the children was looked after. Verandas, he understood, were extremely important in the Indian climate. The building was designed at a time when there wasn't any central air conditioning. So this requirement to have outside, inside, all the time was an integral part of his, his design requirement for the climate. Latins was also quite aware of the fact that his designs might become obsolete as time goes on. And in the archives, we found letters that he had written. In this letter, for instance, which he wrote to Lord Irwin, he makes a plea that he knows that his furniture and designed elements are going to become obsolete as new trends and new fashions come up. And so he says that why can't there be basements or storerooms in which, which can be used, and he uses the French word, a garde de meuble, which means a furniture storeroom, um, uh, in which furniture that he had designed that became unfashionable could be stored because he knew that his designs were so classic that they would become fashionable again 50 years later, 60 years later. And so he, he's, got, he's got spaces in which he had created, in which his own designed elements could be stored safely to be brought back. So he, he had a vision of posterity when he was designing this space. But for all his vision, there were changes that were coming up again and again. So, for instance, now these are two photographs that you can see of the same room. But they look completely different. The carpet is the same, but in one you can see that the ceiling has been completely painted. And that painting was uh, arranged, that painting was uh, done at the time of Lady Willingdon, who wanted a much grander space than the kind of stark, modern, clean space that Latians had originally designed. And after the Willingdons left in 1937, Latians' son had to be invited to reconfigure and redesign the house and restore it to the way in which his father had intended. And so the, paint, the, the painted ceiling was painted over and it was whitewashed and made back into the way in which uh, he had originally intended it. But you can see that drawing rooms and spaces once designed in one way were changed because of how occupants different occupants wanted those spaces. These historic photographs are revealing also for another reason. Can you notice and look around you in this photograph, for instance? This is a drawing room in which no two people are looking at each other. Today, when we design a sitting room area, our primary concern is to be able to facilitate conversation so that people can face each other. But what does a room like this reveal? Nobody is looking at each other. Instead, they're all facing in one direction. And at the left side, in front of the table, directly opposite a fireplace, you see a Tibetan carpet on the floor from where a viceroy could have stood and addressed the gathering. So this is for a place where people can comfortably sit and listen to a speech that is being made in that environment. We don't understand these kinds of photographs today and we don't read into them the purpose of the rooms adequately because we imagine that a drawing room has to be arranged in a certain manner for a certain purpose. And we don't quite know how to read the purpose sometimes for these rooms 
unless we look at this documentation. So that takes us into another kind of understanding. By contrast, a drawing room like this was arranged for a conversation. So it's a very different kind of, of use that each room is put to. This is a photograph of how the bathroom in the Dwarka suite looks now. And it's an extraordinary bathroom. This suite is today used for state guests, but once was originally the Viceroy's own uh, suite, his bedroom, and this was the attached en suite bathroom. And what you can see is it didn't have mirrors set into the walls as you see today. Designed in the 1920s, this was a radical modern bathroom. It has an island wash basin, a bathtub that projects into the middle of the room. It has a spray shower on top of the bathtub. At the back of the bathtub, on the photograph on the right, you can see that it resolves into a Roman arch. But the area in front of the bathtub where the drain is has a shower, but it also has pipes on all three sides on three sides which would which have jet sprays and if you look at the tap that accompanies it you can see that it's designed to it says plunge shower or spray and you can change the lever to be able to use it in any of the three ways that you want to use the tub now this was designed in the 1920s and it's almost 100 years old this bathroom we are still trying to get bathroom in bathrooms designed today architects are trying to make which have island wash basins in the middle of the in the middle of the uh, bathroom space and the kind of plumbing that's going to be required to be able to create this so we can't just label latians as somebody who is trying to bring historic architecture to to india through rashtrapati bhavan but we also have to see him as a thorough and a revolutionary modernist architect who is trying to bring in new designs as he is going along. And I think one of the best ways to be able to study that incorporation of different design elements is in the furniture that he designed. In the middle of this arch, for instance, is a, is a cupboard which was designed for a robe, a ceremonial robe that the Viceroy would wear, which was exceptionally heavy, just before he would enter the Darbar Hall. Now this robing cupboard is at the end of a long grand ceremonial corridor, a private corridor that you would have to turn left from at the moment of this encountering this cupboard to be able to enter the Darbar Hall. It would give, just walking down this passageway would fill the Viceroy with a sense of purpose. And you would approach this particular monument that you see in front of you, which has elements like the India Gate, as you can see. And the robe, there's a man that can climb into this robing cover, take out the grand robe, put it onto the Viceroy, which is almost like a kind of a, a ceremonial transformation that the person would go through before they would enter the Darbar Hall. So the, the furniture was designed with that sense of altering the sensibility of the person who's using it. The design of the furniture, I think, is one of the best places to be able to understand his, formally understand his training and how he tries to put together movement, the line with the circle, the movement of, the strip of, of forms, how he's using the oval form, puncturing it, where the circular stretcher comes in at the bottom, how it complements a straight line on top. Some of these elements of furniture design have become famous and have been reproduced by other furniture designers, copied and used in many other places in what is now called the Latian's design. But I think most people tend to forget the kind of modern invention these things were for all their classicism in the finials and in the design of the stretcher at the base of the table. Look also at the completely modern inlay work that is available on the floor below it. Some of the designs, some of the furniture is fixed and it's made of stone. It's not all made out of wood. And also some of the wood furniture is not gilded, but it's actually painted. 
A lot of it has been left in the natural shade of teak, which he liked a lot because the furniture, the teak was sourced in India itself, and he utilized those Indian elements. Again, you can see that play with thoroughly modern designs. Can you see how the, the, the movement of the circle resolves into the lines of the squares um, on the back of the chair, and how the lines continue and become fluid as they come into different portions of the same item of furniture. He used older designs, Heppelwhite, Chippendale. Um, the sketch that you see on the left is uh, made on the journey on the ship while he was coming to India, imagining in his mind the kind of furniture he would use. So he was willing to borrow other people's design ideas as well. But I want to focus more on his design inventions. A little triangular side table. Square when you look at it on one side, but triangular when you look at it from on top. And it's all about spiraling energy when you look at the, when you look at the stretcher at the base, the, the, the holding the table together. Looking at the furniture also allows us to be able to understand city planning. It's the same line and form that he's using even for the creation of the whole city. So it's possible to go from macro to micro or from micro to macro using the same design principles and the same design vision of this person um, to be able to see what was guiding his, how he was applying the same principles for the city as he was applying to the quotidian, to the small, to the everyday. So where you can see that same triangular pattern in this portion right on top of the city, you can see the same square pattern in the middle of the city which you can see in the furniture. Now there are humorous anecdotes about all of this as well. Some people say that uh, these circles that you see next to each other are a spoof or are a, are a joke about his spectacles, uh, which were these circular spectacles that he used to wear all the time. And in many a cartoon that he has made, uh, he has represented, have, they, these spectacles have become a kind of a, a marker for him. Once again, you see a triangular piece of furniture with a folding tabletop, um, using a square with a circle, and then using the same clean line to be able to let the flaps fall down and turn a circular table into uh, a triangle. So moving from the furniture, one's able to see the same movement of line as one starts looking at the plans for the rooms. Um, like we were looking at the buildings, we can also look at them in the same way in the, in the interior spaces. A good example of this classicism is in what is now the State Library. Now this is a photograph of the State Library that is taken with the full Jaisalmer stone and the inlay work visible to us. I'm not going to talk about the sides and how the circular dome resolves into the square room and I'm not going to get into all of those details with you just now. I'm going to focus instead on a very political moment, which is the inlay work. Now, in the middle of this inlay, can you see amongst the designs, there is a swastik. But in the 1940s, this swastik, this historic photograph, shows that a map chest was brought and covered up the swastik before the photograph was taken for Country Life magazine. <laughs> Why was this swastik covered up? Well, the obvious reason was because, of course, the swastik had by that time been associated with the Nazis. And um, being on the opposite end of, of uh, in, the, in, the, in the Second World War, there was no way that the swastik was going to be showcased at the heart of the library of the British Empire of the resident of the Viceroy. So it, it was it, where the Viceroy was resident, it was really not going to work to be able to allow the, the swastik to be revealed in a public photograph. And so it was promptly covered up. But Latians, when he designed the house, the swastik was not something he thought of as being associated with the Nazis. He, in fact, thought of the swastik as an ancient symbol, which we all know that it was, linked with very ancient civilizations with a lot of symbolism associated with it, a radiating sun, uh, as we normally, which we normally associate with the idea of the swastik. 
And so the use of the yellow Jaisalmer in the library with the radiating swastik was quite appropriate from the symbolism that he was thinking of um, in the early 20th century, which was quite different to what the swastik came to mean by the middle of the 20th century. These are some of the inlay design patterns. And so what I'm trying to get at is how traditional design is being mixed with a very modern idea simultaneously. Inlay work we all know is famous in Indian buildings, Pietro Dura and so on, but not the Tao not the, uh, sorry, not the, not the symbol of Taoism, which you can see in this uh, uh, pattern on the floor of a courtyard in, in Rashtrapati Bhavan. Okay, so coming back to how we can actually associate the designs of the furniture with the other design sensibilities of the architect. If you look at the borders of this long drawing room that I was looking at earlier, you can see that that table, that little gold table, which we were just looking at the details of, has exactly the same legs which are in the floor pattern on the side. Let's go back. Look at the movement of those, the furniture legs, and then look at the floor pattern on the side of this room. Now, this long drawing room is extremely important for a designer because it's been arranged and rearranged so many times that it tells us about the changing sensibilities of each generation. Um, so while Latians might have designed it like this, I showed you another photograph of how Lady Willingdon rearranged it and turned it into a much grander drawing room with a painted ceiling. In the uh, time of, uh, this is how that long drawing room looks <laughs> uh, today, where it has been turned into a big conference room. So these rooms have been changed, and at the time of Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed, when he was the president, it was turned into an indoor badminton court. Um, so, you know, everyone's been trying to use these rooms differently as time has gone on. And this documentation and looking into the archives is extremely important because it actually tells us about the changing sensibilities and requirements for each generation. And as I was saying, a house has to be able to the design capacity of a space to be able to lend itself to its different occupants and changing exigencies is what, these, what this documentation reveals. Now, on the left, you see an original sketch of how he imagined the upper loggia to be as a grand veranda that was painted. By the time it was executed, it had a small sitting area in this large veranda-like space with outdoors on both left and right so the wind could pass through the space and keep it cool. Of course, now today when you go there, it's completely changed. It's been enclosed, windows have been put in, a false ceiling has been put in, and the place has been air-conditioned because today we want everything to be air conditioned. So a lot of the outdoor spaces or veranda spaces and balconies have all been enclosed and turned into indoor air conditioned sitting areas and passageways. What became particularly troublesome after independence, however, were many markers of the British Empire that were all over this house. Viceroy's house was all about the pomp and splendor, the ceremony of the British Empire. Fireplaces are a good indication of this. At the back of every fireplace, we have what is called the chimney piece. Uh, the whole chimney piece has a fire back. And these fire backs were designed out of wrought iron, They're cast actually. Um, and the one on the right says George Rex, King George the Emperor with the Royal Imperial uh, crown on top of it. And then you have another one which has George slaying the dragon which was again a, a metaphoric use of uh, the name George and was used in many places in the British Empire. So all the fireplaces had in the state rooms had these um, firebacks and many of them became embarrassing to the government of India upon independence. And so these fireplaces were blocked up because they weren't really lighting fires in them anymore and so you can't see many of them. But some have been retained, like this one in the committee room, where you can still see the fireback 
behind the fireplace. There were other changes that took place in the house. So what is today called the Ashoka Hall was in fact formerly the ballroom. It's a grand reception room today, largely kept open for, for, for large parties. In the middle of the ceiling is a Qajar painting and around it were a series of other paintings that were put in later, painted on the ceiling, um, painted by an Italian artist in a Persianate style. The most exciting thing about this ballroom was, of course, it was completely transformed in Lady Irwin's time, where she turned it into a grand reception room, not wanting it as a ballroom at that time. The ornate fireplaces um, at the two ends of this room have a Persian inscription on them. And the Persian inscription is under a portrait of the poet Nizami on one side and his muse, which is on the other side of the ballroom. And the prepossession or the ambition of the architect was such that he puts down this Persian architect, uh, this Persian cup of uh, uh, inscription, which says, God who has created the throne, his might can also create the palace. Um, a beautiful building like this cannot be seen anywhere on earth or in the sky. So, I mean, putting down this inscription made quite a statement about what the architect thought of his work. The Persian inscription can be looked at as a way of thinking about grandeur, inclusion, inclusivity, incorporating the ideals of the Mughal Empire on the one hand, but dressing it up in a very ornate European style on the other. And this kind of an arrangement of a poet and his muse on two opposite ends of a ballroom may once have lent the room the kind of frisson that is needed in a ballroom. But how inappropriate that was post-independence when you didn't have ballrooms any longer, you didn't have ballroom dances, and all of this had become irrelevant after 1947. So how then was the challenge of nationalizing the house going to be undertaken? This became quite a story. And that's what the book really deals with, as to how the, how the house was nationalized, how it was made into a more appropriate setting for an Indian environment. This particular room, the Ashoka Hall, caused perhaps the greatest amount of problems. One of the reasons for it was that shortly after independence, the honorary secretary of the Arya Samaj um, wrote, in fact, he wrote pre-independence in 1941, requesting the Viceroy to introduce Devanagari script in the paintings of the Viceregal Darbar Hall, along with the Urge existing Persian script, because the two language and two scripts for two communities movement had already started taking uh, holding ground. And um, the, the request was dismissed by the Viceroy's office because technically the secretary of the Arya Samaj had written to say that these Persian inscriptions are in the Darbar Hall, whereas they were not in the Darbar Hall, they were in the ballroom or what was later called the Ashoka Hall. And um, uh, so there was no further truck with the Arya Samaj on this matter in 1941, but the the lesson was learned and uh, it was necessary that this requirement to bring in a different identity into the into this house was there the home of the first citizen of a country as diverse as india would have to be seen as something being pluralistic as as non-partisan it had to be neutral or inclusive to all of its different visitors and so um much later um a new set of paintings was included in the corridors of the Rashtrapati Bhavan, especially outside the president's office, where the passages were painted with shloks and verses from the Bhagavad Gita, done by artists from Shanti Niketan, um, to be able to counterbalance the Persian inscriptions that might have been there in the ballroom. But let's not forget that even in Latian's own time, he was quite open to the inclusion of 
a diverse Hindu element. So there were some firebacks, for instance, which had the lotus symbol in them. Just as you had some firebacks that had European or British symbols in them. Here is another contrasting photograph of how the uh, of how one of the lower basement um, uh, verandas, open verandas, were once upon a time, and how they have changed and become enclosed and air conditioned today. As I was saying earlier, incorporating open spaces into the indoor was an integral part of his work. Look at the scale of the framing of the sky, as you can see in this internal courtyard. Look at the people sitting on the left-hand side. Fountains. Um, many of these open oculi um, or open um, domes have now been closed up and can't be seen in this manner where rain and water enter the different spaces of the house as they once used to. Okay, so coming to the national, nationalization of the house. Now this was, as I was saying, a fraught process. Um, the home had to change with the coming of the early presidents of India. A home that was designed to display the might of the British Empire now had to become the home of a democratically elected republic's president. And that's a very different thing because he couldn't quite live like a Mughal, he couldn't quite live like a monarch, but he had to live like a democratic leader within this house, very much as a tenant, occupying it for a few years till the next occupant comes in. So what agency did the state have in redesigning this space? And who were the people who were engaged in the redesigning? So you'll have to read the book, I'm afraid, to be able to get into all the details of how that took place. But I think one of the most memorable things that took place when they were thinking about redesigning the banquet hall was this particular banquet, which was held in honor of the Dalai Lama. And uh, you can see President Rajendra Prasad and Jawaharlal Nehru with the, 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 the Dalai Lama, a young Dalai Lama sitting in between them. And importantly, the, the grand table in the state banquet hall has been replaced by a seating on the floor, very much in the Indian style. The guests all sat on PDs. They were served um, on their low uh, uh, tables that were provided for them as they squatted and ate their meal in the Indian style. Nationalism was all around, and there was a lot of experimentation that went on into thinking about what would be an appropriate Indian interior and how do you serve in an Indian style? How do you transform this grand house into an Indian home? The State Banquet Hall subsequently um, was restored and it had lots of animal trophies, hunting trophies, heads and skins of animals that were on the walls once upon a time. And during the presidency of Pratibha Patil, it was considered very politically incorrect to be able to display all these, all these symbols of man's conquest of nature and hunting and hunted animals all around. And those animals were removed and these brocades that you see instead were put up in the, in the banquet hall. So this is an aerial shot looking down at the dining table where you can see the brocades instead of the hunting trophies that would have once been there. So the house has been getting redecorated as time goes on to make it more agreeable to how it is now. This process was, um, went on slowly. Although we achieved independence in 1947, it was only till in 1953 <laughs> that the flag, only the Indian flag began to fly on Rashtrapati Bhavan. Till 1953, for six years, the British and the Indian flags alternated at the building, which you can see in this photograph. Many of the official spaces had insignia of the different viceroys, which you can see on the page on the left. And these were transformed by, which you can see on the page on the right, with insignia of the different regiments of the Indian Army or the different service, defense services of India. 
And that became a third major force that was exerting its influence on the House. The President of India is commander of the armed services. And so the House had to reflect his control over the different regiments of the army and the different uh, elements of all the defense services. And so that exercise, that element had to, had to be manifest in different parts of the House as well. Um, as I told you earlier, the interiors were repainted to be able to have these verses from the Bhagavad Gita. And that's what you could see over here. Okay, when you drive up Raisina Hill and you're approaching Rashtrapati Bhavan, you are met by this pair of elephants. <clears throat> Can you look on the, um, uh, just below the howda on the textile that's being carved on the elephant's body? In the middle of it, there is a circular symbol. Now, you might not be able to see it on your screens because I can't go into presentation mode. It bears the inscription and the insignia of King George. This was removed, chipped away, and sandpapered. And today, when you go there, you see that the inside of the wreath is empty. The insignia of King George has been removed. So some elements which were very obvious and embarrassing were rubbed out of public view. But certain things which were deep in the inside of the house were retained. <laughs> Apparently, quintals or morns of British crowns that were on top of every fence, door, light fitting, were all removed and junked and put into the quartermaster's store. And <laughs> there are kilos and kilos of them which are lying there now. Um, these are some of the removed crowns that were on different parts of the house, which you don't see anymore. Um, they were in public places. They are not in the interior. Uh, uh, they were not in the interiors only. Now, these, <laughs> these crown fittings used to be on every pelmet, on top of every door lintel. In fact, in the photograph on the bottom left, you can see the old screws still there, on top of which the four-headed lion, the Indian symbol, has been put. Even the light fittings had to be changed, and the four-headed lion had to be put on top of them where there was no fitting once upon a time or there was no crown once upon a time. You know, they had to suddenly Indianize the building and put the symbol of India everywhere, just as there was once the symbol of Britain everywhere. But as I was saying, in some places, they retained the old touch. And one of the most charming uh, places where you can see the old touch is in the entrance in the doorknobs to the library, where they've kept the old uh, doorknobs which have the British lion still, just as a small reminder of the fact that when this house was made and what were the politics at the time when it was made, because that after all is very much also part of its history. In the rest of the house, of course, all the doorknobs have been changed and the door doorknobs now conceal where the old ones used to be. And now you can see the Ashoka Chakra with a much more Ajanta-like pattern of a floral design below it. The furniture as well was changed, and on top of some of the old chairs, the four-headed lion was placed within a carving that was attached on top of the chairs to be able to make them more Indian and more appropriate for the Indian nation state. Some of the fireplaces, which were in the more obvious places, like in the president's study, for instance, there um, the, the fire back was replaced and changed. And you can see there's an empty space. There's no longer the black cast iron fire back at the back of the fireplace. It's been removed. Um, even the old Victorian silver um, uh, firearms now have a four-headed lion that's been placed in the center. But perhaps the greatest Indianization and the most visible signs of that nationalism came about after 1947, when the Rashtrapati Bhavan was being used for some years as the National Museum of India. 
1947, to mark Indian independence, a grand exhibition was held at the Royal Academy in London when the choicest examples of Indian art were sent for exhibition to London. When they were returned, they were exhibited at the Rashtrapati Bhavan. Amongst them was the famous bull capital from Rampurva, which was in the Indian Museum in Calcutta previously, but was now placed in the middle of the doorway, looking out onto the central vista, examining the whole vista over India, the throne of India, looks directly, open the doors open, and the seat from the throne of India looks past the Mauryan bull at the column, looking down on down Raisina Hill, straight down onto India Gate. This element of the Mauryan pillar capital being placed within this structure was one of the great elements that was done about Indian for Indian nationalism that was brought into the building. Similarly, Muhammad Hanif, who was a sculpture teacher at the Lucknow College of Art, was asked to make imitations of the Gupta gold, gold coins, because the Gupta period used to be called the golden age of Indian history. And these were considered more appropriate. So he made these large plaster two-dimensional, plaster cast two-dimensional sculptures. And they were framed in wood and put up at important places, like you can see in the committee room or in different places where the presidents would sit. Today, they are now scattered in various incidental corridors uh, in Rashtrapati Bhavan. And they all hark back to the golden age of the Guptas, as it used to be called. Now, on the subject of the golden age is where I'm going to end, um, moving out of these corridors, but looking instead at the throne of India in the middle of the Darbar Hall, finally. What you will see is, although this Darbar Hall, when you look at the book, you will notice that there are sketches that it was designed for the king and queen to sit beside each other. This was changed, and a new throne was placed, which would be appropriate for the president of India. And the greatest masterpiece that was considered to be left over from that exhibition that went to Burlington House or the Royal Academy in London was this grand Gupta period statue of the Buddha. Behind the throne of India, the president of India, is today placed this amazing statue, which is of the Buddha from the Gupta period. It's the best preserved Gupta period statue in existence, I think, anywhere. The Mathura Museum has three others or four others like it, um, but nothing is quite as spectacular as this particular piece, where even traces of the original pigment that once uh, would have colored this sculpture are still pre is still preserved. The Buddha makes for another symbol of Indian nationalism. It's a symbol that actually talks about the fact that um, the, the highest achievement is not one of what, is, what you're blessed with, but what man can achieve. It's the greatest achievement of, of humankind, the strength of humankind. And I think that's what the amazing, that is the, the best thing that we can see in the transformation of Indian nationalism where these Buddhist symbols were used uh, to be able to talk about uh, what the Indian state really stands for, the greatest achievement of humankind. It's about an hour. Um, I'm going to stop this talk over here. I'm happy to take questions. And I'm really very sorry about the technical glitch, which completely threw me off balance in the beginning of the talk. I hope you've been able to see some of the slides, um, but um, uh, they're not as grand as I had hoped. Um, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the way that um, uh, I would have wanted them to be seen. But anyway, there we are. I'll get out of the live video mode and take on your questions, if you have any. Me, I wonder if I'm live now. And um, I'm happy to take your questions. Like I said earlier, I'm really sorry about the technical glitch that we encountered. So um, let me know if you have any queries. I read one or two comments that had come in which said that, yeah, um, people do make reproduction furniture of this nature. And several people do. Indeed, Candia Lachins is one of the people who does them and uh, who does make it. And uh, she was extremely helpful to us 
in the writing of this book and was one of the guiding spirits, in fact, behind the creation of this book who advised us. Um, she was going to write one of the chapters until it was taken over by Laura Ungaro um, on the furniture. And um, there we are. Um, um, So if there are any other questions or comments, um, I'm happy to take them on. Um, so yes, where did the hunting trophies go? Where did the lions or the crowns go? Uh, and uh, why were these things the way they... So one of the answers to that, it's a good question, I think, um, the Rashtrapati Bhavan very quickly created a museum for themselves. And uh, they began to house things that were no longer needed, either in the storerooms or into these new museums that began to be created. So when you get a visitor's ticket to today go into, uh, to see the Rashtrapati Bhavan and they take you on a guided tour, uh, and they take you to the Mughal Gardens and so on, they also take you to the museums. There used to be, um, um, one museum which was called the Marble Hall Museum, the Marble Museum which has no longer been used. There was another museum which only contained the President's gifts, that is also no longer being used. Instead, um, two new museums have been created in the compound, which are much larger and grander museums with several underground stories um, that you can visit today to be able to see the uh, trophies and the remains which are no longer on display, including some items of furniture, lots of dioramas about Indian history, and uh, the gifts that the presidents of India have received during their different tenures, which are all on display. Um, I think uh, why the, common, the tricolor and the Indian flag were used simultaneously for many years was, has a lot to do with the history of the Commonwealth and the graduated degree of autonomy that was experienced with the uh, gradual removal of the powers of the Commonwealth in the way that which the Indian state and other colonized nations began to see themselves. This process of nationalization and nationalism that India went through was not unique. All colonized countries had to come up with a visual vocabulary for their own um, for their own an insignia, for their own states. These um, different colonized countries came up with strategies on how to nationalize their currency, their postage stamps. All of this had to be debated in their respective parliaments and a vision had to guide what was going to be important. Were these going to be religiously guided symbols or were they going to hark back to history? And India, by and large, chose symbols that were going to be a celebration of the land and the labor and the people of India on its uh, currency and all of its stamps in the early years, apart from the father of the nation, which was put on many, who was, whose portrait was put on many things. Um, so that's what guided the creation of the visual vocabulary of the nation state. Um, yes, I think a uh, question that's just arrived on my WhatsApp, uh, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, what bearing does all of this have and what am I trying to say about the redesigning of uh, Central Vista today? Um, like I said, every, uh, <laughs> every building, every period has its own needs and exigencies. The vision of this architect had been to be able to create something that was so extraordinary that would withstand the demands of different occupants and different political exigencies. It's lasted a hundred years fantastically well. Um, it's managed to satisfy a huge number of interests. When we think about the atrocities that this building became symbolic of, this building cost infinitely more than what it was supposed to cost. And that's the usual way in which building projects work. You put out a cost that it's gonna cost 20,000 crores today, 
But really, can those buildings and can all of that be achieved in 20,000 crores? Probably not. You're only going to end up spending much more. And the largest amount of controversy in the press when Latians was asked to design this building was that what was the need to be able to spend so much Indian taxpayers' money to be able to celebrate the grandeur of the British Empire? In fact, it's said that on independence, Gandhiji once said that the building should not be used as a palace for the president of India. Instead, he recommended that it should be turned into a hospital. He recommended that a place which has been made by the blood, sweat, and tears of the Indian people to oppress the Indian people should become a space instead for the healing of the Indian people. And of course, that was put page two, and uh, Pandit Nehru had it tur turned into a, a grand residence for the president of India. Um, but we have to be able to see that the expenses that are involved in the creation of buildings like this is not small. And um, that's, that's something that we need to bear in mind as we enter another building phase that is projected for this territory. Um, I think we also need to think about uh, what bearing this has on our current circumstances from another perspective which is the environmental impact that buildings like this have. Um, you know, we've come into an age when we are reviving Indian history, conservation, and we've come to understand a very important concept of Indian building, which is in the true spirit of the history of Indian architecture, which is called Jirnodhara. You renovate, you make do, you improve on what you have, Many nation cap uh, capitals of the world, whether it is Berlin or the Palace of Westminster, where you have the House of Commons and the House of Lords, have historic buildings. They have historical pa historic parliament spaces created before central heating and air conditioning and mo cars and vehicles and parking requirements. But they didn't chuck out the Palace of Westminster when they needed a new modern building, uh, you know, just because it wasn't, they, they learned to adapt it they learned to renovate. And we've been given a set of buildings over here which are huge, capacious, grand, and can be renovated. We need to think in terms of climate change and carbon neutrality and leaving less and less of a footprint in the kind of ways in which we are going to adapt our buildings rather than just break everything down and rebuild something again, which is just ridiculously expensive. We need to think instead about how we can adapt what we have and leave less of a carbon footprint. Um, those design strategies have not been talked about so much in the public domain. What has been coming out instead has been a story and a narrative about breaking something down and adding to it and creating new buildings in the Central Vista, uh, including a new parliament house. And, and perhaps that needs some re-evaluation. Um, the third major aspect of this is that what I've tried to, what I was able to do when I was writing this book was I was able to go into the CPWD archive and into the Royal Institute of British Architects archive, the record room of Rashtrapati Bhavan itself, and dig out files and documentation that went back decades and even a century. And they revealed the kind of conversation, the discussions in parliament, the public participation and letters to the editors that had been written in different newspapers, what conscientious citizens had done at that time, holding that architect and the designer and the government accountable for the decisions it was taking, not just on the finial and the dome and the shape of the door, but the furnishing fabrics and so on. And this went on way into the 1970s, in fact, because like the question that you've just asked me that somebody has just posed is, uh, how did this process of nationalization take so long? It wasn't just the six years of the two flags flying together. Actually, the building took much longer to nationalize. Indian government didn't have the money to change all the epaulets and the buckles on all the staff members' uniforms, which had to be changed from the crown to the lion on every little insignia, everywhere from belt buckles to lapels to you name it. I mean, for hundreds of staff members, 
um, all this had to be changed, and this needs money to be able to change all of this. And you have to remember the Indian state didn't have any money at independence to be able to execute all these changes. And it took about 25 years to really fully nationalize this building in an appropriate way and gradually remove British insignia and replace them with Indian ones. So in the same way, we need to think today about um, what is going to be, and, and this became a major issue in parliament, which was that, okay, we need a final deadline by when the nationalization of Rashtrapati Bhavan is going to end. And in the same way, the design sensibilities transformations that are being expected today, um, I don't see that kind of public participation in this question as was the case in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, which was fantastic because I was able to access all that public participation in the records to be able to write the book, you know, today. So, so there are lessons to be learned um, from this for our times. Um, I don't know if there are any further questions. Um, no. Um, okay, so if that's it, then I'm going to call it a day. Um, thanks a lot for watching and for being there. And uh, have a good evening. All right. Bye.